So, like I said, today uh, the intention is that we are going to do a tour through all of the sort of common file formats that get used in next generation sequencing. So there's a bunch of these and the names turn up all over the place. So really the point of this session was just to kind of demystify this and sort of go through, show how each of these are structured, what sort of information they contain, any oddities in the way that they're put together um, so that when you come to use them again in future, there's nothing sort of strange and mysterious about them. The uh, things that we're going to look at, I'm going to break down into sections. So we're kind of going to start on the left hand side of this with uh, file formats that store raw sequence, then we're going to work through those that store alignment data, um, those that store genome annotation, those that can be used for representing quantitations once you've done that with your data, uh, and then finally we'll have a brief look at storing uh, variant call data as well. So I'm going to step through each of these in turn uh, and explain how they work and what's in them. So let's start on the left hand side of here uh, with raw sequence. And we're going to start with the simplest possible format that we can uh, use, which is the format for just storing a reference sequence. So with NGS, uh, one of the things that you're obviously going to need to do is to deal with uh, reference sequences. So here we have an existing um, assembled sequence uh, with no other information. So I'm not going to put any annotations. We're not going to try and put any qualities or anything else. It's a known sequence. And the simplest format and the format most commonly used for this is the FASTA format. And it's been around forever, this one. Um, and it's about as simple as a file format gets. You have two parts to it. You have a header line, which is a single line, starts with a greater than symbol. Immediately following that, then up to the first space in the header line is the name of the sequence and this needs to be a unique name across all of the sequences in a particular file and after that you can do what you like um, so you can have as much or as little information in here but the format only really cares about the data up to the um, first space on the header line um, below that you can then enter your raw sequence FASTA isn't a DNA specific file format. You can enter protein sequence in it as well, but obviously we're talking about NGS sequences here. So uh, mostly we're talking about genome sequence. So you can put your sequence in there. There's no uh, convention for uh, the lengths of lines on here. You can put all of your sequence onto one line. You can split it over multiple lines at any size, um, and that's fine. Uh, the way you know you get to the end of a sequence entry is either that you get to the end of the file or you get to the header line for the next sequence. And FASTA format can accommodate multiple sequences by simply concatenating them one after the other. So you can make multi FASTA files by stacking them one on top of each other. So here I've got two stuck, one on top of each other. But in real data, you'll have sort of genome size sequences, so they can be quite big. The letters that are actually in here, um, most of the time they're just going to be conventional GATC, but the format itself allows for uh, other characters to be in here as well. And there is a sort of standard set of what are called ambiguity codes that can go in. So if your sequence is not completely known, you can select from this standard list of IUPAC uh, codes. So on the left hand side, you can see the single letter code that can go into your uh, sequence and on the right hand side is how it should be interpreted so obviously GATC and U are just the sort of four standard bases and everything else is some combination of bases so for example an S would mean that you had either a C or a G and with these there are strict alternates there's no way to indicate that a C would be more likely than a G um, it's sort of it can be either of these alternatives okay so that same set of ambiguity codes um, features in a, a few of the different file for, for formats. In fact, in all of the ones that represent sequences, as well as the standard DNA bases, you can use any of these codes in the format as well, and that will work. A couple of other big concepts that turn up in multiple file formats are probably worth introducing at this point as well. So if you have a FASTA file, if it represents uh, a genome, for example, um, you're going to have all of the chromosomes stacked on top of each other, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, however far down it goes in your species. And if you are making multiple reads from that file, 
you may well be pulling out different chromosomes at different times. So I want to pull out chromosome eight and then I want to pull out chromosome 12. Now I want to pull out chromosome three. And with a normal FASTA file, if I wanted to put out, pull out chromosome 12, the only way to do that is to start at the top of the file, read my way down into the file until I find chromosome 12 and then start extracting the sequence. So you can imagine if you're doing multiple retrievals of small parts of sequences, um, from different parts of the file, that's really inefficient because you're going to end up reading huge amounts of data that you don't actually care about in order to get to the bit that you do. So something that happens in a lot of these file formats is that there is the ability to create what's called an index. And an index is simply a way to be able to quickly leap into the file at the point where the data you want exists to be able to rapidly extract the relevant data without having to do all of this inefficient reading from the top of the file. So for FASTA sequences, that means you would be able to pull out a specific subsequence from a particular sequence and a particular part of it without having to read extraneous data. Um, for FASTA indexing, because FASTA files have been around forever, uh, there are a few different formats, but probably the most common one uh, that's used for indexing these is the SAMTools uh, FAIDX program, so FASTA index. Um, SAM tools is used for reading a lot of different sequence formats, but uh, we'll come across it for both FASTA and later on for some of the alignment formats. And what happens for most of these indexes is that they don't touch your original data file, so your original FASTA file won't be changed, but alongside it, it will create a second index file. So the convention is that you end up with a file with the same start to its name as the FASTA file, but the FA extension <coughs> is removed and is replaced with an FAI. So it's basically the original file name with an additional I on the end uh, for the index. And that index simply stores byte offsets. So it tells you if you want to go to chromosome 12, then you need to go four and a half million bytes into the file and start reading there. And that'll be the start of chromosome 12. And they'll save waypoints within the chromosome so you can leap to uh, the a uh, place that's close to where you want to start reading and then sort of step out from there. Um, so we'll see this same thing come back up um, in uh, a few different file formats when we get there. The other big uh, concept that we'll see in a lot of these is the idea of using compression. So a lot of these formats uh, have lots of data in and they are really big um, and they are stored as originally as plain text and that plain text is stored quite inefficiently. So it uses a lot more disk space to store the file than you might be comfortable with because yeah, disk space is expensive. Um, you can generally get around a 3 to a 5% decrease in the size of most of these file formats by compressing them. So that's a huge saving on disk. Um, so a lot of the time you will see these files existing in a compressed form. There are two common generic compression systems that you'll see used. There is gzip compression, which is pretty much like your conventional zip file. Uh, and you'll see these ending with a .gz. Um, it's very well supported. Everything that knows anything about compressed data understands gzip compression. Even things like some of the uh, text editors will be able to transparently uncompress gzip files. Um, you might also see buzzip files, or strictly buzzip2. Um, those end up with uh, a .bz2 extension. Uh, there's trade-offs between these two. So bzip uh, files are a lot slower to compress. So it takes more CPU to compress your data, but the size is quite a lot smaller. Well, not quite a lot, but substantially smaller than the equivalent gzip uh, compression. Uh, but the decompression is about the same speed. So it takes you longer to make them, but they're a bit smaller and you can still read them back at the same uh, rate. It's much less common to see that. Some places do use it uh, where the disk space is really uh, critical, but the gzip compression is by far the most common. Now, there is a trade-off to make when you're compressing this. Your data will get smaller, but these general compression schemes uh, don't allow for random access into your file. So if you compress your data, it's much harder then to read 
from a random portion internally into the file, you're back into reading from the top of the file and then going through. So for general compression, uh, it generally doesn't work with indexing schemes um, and the formats that want to use both indexing and compression use custom compression schemes that do allow for that. Commonly, you'll see FASTA files, gzip compressed, and you'll see sequence files, uh, gzip compressed, and then everything else uses something that's a bit more custom. Let's move on to the next file format. So the next sort of level of complexity uh, with sequence formats is the FASTQ format. And FASTQ is really a, an extension on the idea of FASTA. So FASTA is just, I need to store the basis for this sequence, and that's it. With FASTQ format, we have an extra level of information. So not only do we want to store the bases, but the Q in here stands for quality. So because this is for data which is coming off a sequencer, as well as storing the base calls, we also store the sequencer's own assessment of the confidence that it has in each of those base calls. So a FASTQ uh, format file is a little bit more structured than we had in a FASTA file. FASTA file, remember, is two sections. There's a header and then arbitrary numbers of sequence lines. FASTQ format uh, files occur in four line chunks. So there are four separate lines in each entry. The first one is a header line, which again supplies a unique identifier in much the same way that we get with a FASTA one. Um, then we have a sequence line with base calls. Then we have a midline, uh, which is kind of a bit like a second header. I'll talk about that in a second. And then finally, we have a fourth line, which is the measures of confidence, the quality scores. Um, so there is a correspondence then between the chorus, the quality score and the base so that we can tell how confident we should be in the base call that was made. Again, this is a format you can stack up multiple entries in. So having done a single entry here, we can then just add another one underneath and we can keep adding many millions of sequences in parallel into the same format. Let's look a bit more at the structure of this then. So here's a single FASTQ entry. Okay, so our four lines, the header line. Header line has to start with an at symbol and after that you have, the format says that you have to unique, have a unique identifier up to the first space, exactly the same as we saw with FASTA and then after that you can do what you like. Um, in this case, there is uh, often structure within this name. So particularly because most of the data that goes into this format at the moment is still coming from Illumina sequencers, then it's kind of instructive to see what Illumina actually put in that identifier. After that, then we have the base calls, okay, all on one line in this instance. And again, these can include um, the ambiguity codes that we saw before. Um, quite often they don't, but they can. Then we have a midline. Uh, midline was a thing that seemed like a good idea when they first invented the format. And then later on, it was decided that actually it wasn't actually providing much use. So the midline has to start with a plus. Uh, and then what you'll normally say on the midline is nothing. Um, occasionally, some uh, programs will just replicate the ID line in there, uh, but it's a bit of a historical hangover that's a bit too difficult to remove now, um, but it's not really providing any additional useful information. And then finally, the fourth line are the quality scores. Okay, So these are a measure of confidence in the accuracy of the base call based on sort of single to, signal to noise assessment. And they are what's called an ASCII encoded FRED score. So I shall explain what those are in a second. Um, but what you can see is that there's the same number of quality score letters as there are base calls, and there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So um, this G is the quality score for that G call, this D is the quality score for that A call, and this colon is the quality score for that C call. Okay, so one-to-one -one mapping between the two. Let's look at the additional structure in the header. So I said that all that the FASTQ file format says is that you have to have a unique identifier. Beyond that, it doesn't care. It can just be numbers going up. It could be sequential letters, whatever. Um, but Illumina put more useful information into their header. So although it is um, a unique string, um, it's also a colon delimited set of fields. So the things that they put in here, obviously it has to start with an at because that's what the format says. The next thing in there is the instrument ID. So this is the actual identifier on the sequencer that generated it. So I can tell which machine this came from. We have the run number. So this 34 is, this is the 34th run that that instrument has done. 
we have the barcode off the flow cell that the sequencer was running. So we can track exactly which, uh, barcode, uh, which flow cell was running at the time. We have the lane in the flow cell that the data came from. So this was lane five on this flow cell. We have the tile within the lane. So tiles are just arbitrary subregions of the uh, lane, each lane of the flow cell that gets split up so that you can tell roughly physically where on the flow cell uh, the sequence came from. And then these last two are the X and Y pixel coordinates of the um, cluster that was generating the sequence that we're looking at. So we can position exactly within the structure of the flow cell where the data came from, and we can tell which flow cell it was on and which machine it came from. Finally, after the space, so this is not in the identifier anymore, they append a few other useful bits of information. So this is read number. So if you've done multiple reads from the same insert, it'll tell you whether it was the first, second, third or fourth read that was done. Um, filtered, this is uh, the internal quality control from the sequencer. So um, N means that it wasn't rejected by Illumina's own internal filtering. Uh, so normally, if you're seeing this coming back from a sequencing service, they'll all say N, because if it was a Y, then it would have been kicked out earlier in the pipeline. Uh, the last one is a, um, a historical hangover. So uh, this control thing, you used to run control lanes on Illumina sequences way back in the day before people realized it was way too expensive. Um, so it says control number, so it tells you which lane was the control, but these days it'll always say naught because no one does that anymore. Uh, and then if you've demultiplexed with Illumina's own software, it will tell you which of the subsamples is on the end. So this one wasn't demultiplexed with Illumina, but all of that information can be useful to sort of quality control programs or anything else that wants to assess your data. So it doesn't have to do that in the fast uh, Q file format, but if you've got your data from Illumina, it will. The other type of data that we have in here then is the quality data. And this is another concept that comes back in a few different file formats. So the quality itself is represented as what's called a FRED score. Uh, and a FRED score is a nice convenient numerical score uh, that can be used to assess um, probability in essence. So a FRED score is a transformation of a probability. In this case, the probability is the probability that the base call that's reported would be wrong. Okay, so we want this value to be really low because we don't want the call to be wrong, we want it to be right. Um, what a FRED score does is it takes that original p-value, that probability value, which will be a fractional number, and it converts it into a positive integer. Okay, so it's just a mathematical transformation of the p-value. Um, computers generally are happier with working with integers than they are with floating point numbers. There's an exact representation for an integer, um, and humans kind of like positive small numbers that mean something. So the conversion from a p-value to a FRED score is just a little equation. So we take our original probability, we take the log 10 of that, we multiply it by minus 10, and we take the integer portion of that. So if there's any remaining fractional bits, we just cut it off. That's how you generate your FRED score. But when you're reading this, um, it's pretty intuitive to do. If you have a FRED score of 10, that means you had a p-value of 0.1. So that meant that it's a 10% chance of your call being wrong. A FRED score of 20 is a p-value of 0.01. So that's a 1% chance of it being wrong or 99% chance of it being right. And a FRED score of 30 would be a p-value of 0.001. So a 0.1% chance uh, of it being wrong or a one in, thousand, one in a thousand chance of it being wrong, so a 999 out of a thousand chance of it being right. Okay, so this is kind of 10% error, 1% error, 0.1% error. Okay, so they're quite nice to read FRED scores. And as I say, we'll see FRED scores turn up in a few different formats. Now, for FASTQ, um, we don't actually put the FRED scores into the format. What we saw coming into the quality line wasn't actually a number, it was just a series of letters. So we had a single letter to represent a quality score. So for the for final format, we need to turn these FRED scores into a letter. And to do this, uh, we then do a FRED score encoding. And there is an existing uh, set of mappings between numbers and letters that computers have used 
forever, um, which is the ASCII translation set. So ASCII is a standard set of codes which gives a numerical value to every sort of printable or, and indeed non-printable character that computers use. Okay, and it's been around since the dawn of computing. So this has just been reused uh, in the FASTQ format. Now, there is a problem with this in that you can't just directly transform the FRED scores to their ASCII equivalent. And that's because all of the really low values in the ASCII table, so the things a FRED score will generally run from sort of one up to well, maybe about 60 if it's like super confident. Um, and a lot of those really low ASCII values, sort of one, two, three, four, five, um, are things that you can't actually print. So they're things like um, a carriage return or a new line or a tab character or something like that. So things where you haven't actually got something you can see. So to get around this, instead of using the ASCII table directly, they use the ASCII table with an offset. So instead of starting at naught, they start at a value that's kind of into the normal printable bits of the uh, ASCII table. And in the early days of sequencing, there were two competing standards. Um, so Illumina, who obviously had quite a lot of say in this, said, well, we think that you should add 64 to your FRED score and then use that ASCII value. Okay, so if you have that, the lowest FRED score you can get is one. So that means the lowest encoded value will be 65. So you pretty much start where the real letters start. So you start with capital A, B, C, D, E, F, go all the way through those, then you have a few funky symbols, and then you go through all the lowercase letters, okay? And you can go all the way through until you get into sort of weird things that are around 128, but certainly up to there, you've got easily 60, um, well, in fact, exactly 60 to get you to 124, um, encoded characters, which is plenty. Um, the Sanger Center didn't agree. They thought that was too limiting and that you might need uh, encoded FRED scores of above 60. So they said, well, we're going to start as low down the format as we can. So we're going to do FRED plus 33, which means that they start at ASCII value 34. Okay, so uh, that means the lowest value you can get is this, but now you've got a wider range. So you get some of these strange characters and then you go into numbers and then through some other characters and into the range that Illumina did. Um, in the end, um, the Sanger won. Uh, the world decided that FRED plus 33 was the better standard, and that's what everyone, including Illumina, has used for a few years now. So all of the data you will generate these days is FRED plus 33. All of the data that should be stored in public repositories will be FRED plus 33. Um, but if you're going back to historical data, you might still find FRED plus 64, and it will just be transparently put in a FASTQ file. There's no mechanism in the format itself to indicate the encoding is either 33 or 64. You just kind of have to look at it and try and work it out for yourself. Um, the wrong person won, just incidentally. Um, the Sanger one is actually a lot harder to work with, uh, simply because the special characters that are used to define header or midline, so at symbols and plus symbols, if you start from 33, then those symbols exist in the encoded data. So 64 is an at symbol uh, and 43 is a plus symbol. So both of those are valid quality scores. So you can't do a sanity check on your data just by saying, well, does it start with an at or a plus? Therefore, it must be a header or a midline because now both of those are also valid quality scores. So it made life a bit harder, but eh, that's how it is. Um, so all data now should be Sanger encoded, but occasionally you do still see um, Illumina FRED64 encoded data uh, knocking around and have to do the conversion yourself. Okay, final file format for um, raw sequence then are FAST5 files. Um, and these uh, came about really with the advent of nanopore sequencing. So Oxford Nanopore decided that FAST5 was going to be their standard format that they were going to use to represent their generic uh, raw sequence. 
FAST5 actually on its own is an extension of an existing format called HDF5. So HDF5 is a generic file format. It's used for storing data from lots of different formats and completely sort of um, unrelated fields. Um, and it's designed to be flexible and extensible. And what it is in essence is it's kind of like a little mini file system contained within a single file in that it stores a hierarchical set of um, attributes and that you can put data associated with each of those attributes. So you can build up your own little mini structure. It's kind of a bit like XML or something like that, um, but this time done in a binary format file and it's in a format which is updatable. So you can make an HDF5 file and then you can add to it later on and you can extend it. So it's quite flexible and it's quite nice. Um, so as I say, it's been adopted by Oxford Nanopore for their Nanopore data. And inside this um, single file, it means that not only can they store the base calls, so the same sort of thing as we've seen, but they can also store their raw data, so their sort of signal traces straight off the sequencer. They can store all of the details of how their analysis was done, so the base call settings and things like that, as well as storing the actual call data. Because this is a generic format, uh, there are some nice programs that let you open up uh, an HDF5 file and see what's in it. So this is a view from uh, a program called HDF View, which is a free piece of software for looking at HDF files, where I've opened up um, an Oxford Nanopore FAST5 file, so you can see what it is. So this is the structure that's inside the file, and you can see it looks a bit like a file system with folders and files inside it, except these are kind of attributes um, that are nested within each other. The top level is a set of read uh, objects then. So down here we have many thousands of read objects and I've just expanded out the top read object so that you can see the structure that's inside it. Okay, so within the read we've got a few different sections. We've got the raw um, attribute here where we have the original signal data, so that's the raw data. We've got some other uh, metadata around it, so the channel it came from, various other sort of tracking tags and identifiers that went with the run. And then after we've then run this through a base caller, it will annotate on a new folder in here, this analyses folder. Um, and here we can see that we've done one base calling on here because we only have one subfolder. So this is a 1D base call on here. Um, there's some information about the way the base calling was done. And then inside this base call template, we have a FASTQ attribute, which is then over here, which is a piece of data, which is just a piece of text, it's a string with 21,000 characters in it. And if I double click on that to actually open up the contents of that, what you'll see is it's a standard FASTQ format piece of text that we can then extract out from the FAST5 file and put into a normal FASTQ file, but it's exactly the same format as we saw. Okay, really long in this case and the lines have wrapped because they're so long um, because it's a nanopore uh, read, but it's the same idea, four lines, at symbol for a header, all of the base calls, plus midline that doesn't do anything, and then all the quality scores underneath. Okay, so although it's embedded within something that has greater structure, in the end you can just extract that one part from it, and it's the same format that we've dealt with before. Okay, so between those, those are all the way of representing raw um, nucleotide sequence. Let's move on to look at the next level of uh, information that we can get in here. So this is where you've added um, an alignment to a reference sequence. So aligned reads are generally present in one of three formats, either a SAM, BAM or CRAM format, and as we'll see, these are all closely related to each other. Before I get into the formats, um, we need to have a little bit of a think about how we actually represent um, sort of genomic positions or reference sequence positions. Okay, because different file formats are going to end up doing this slightly differently. So here I've got a very short chromosomal sequence. Okay, it's only like 12 bases or something, uh, where we have two strands because this is double stranded material. So we have a top strand running left to right, five prime to three prime, and a bottom strand running right to left, five prime to three prime. Um, and I want to be able to describe the position of the highlighted bases in here. So if we think about what information we need to do that, 
we need to know which sequence this is. So we need the sequence name or the chromosome name. So in this case, I've called it chromosome X. We need to know where the alignment starts. So we need some kind of start position. We need to know where it ends. So that's either going to be an end position or a length from the start. And we need to know the strand that it's on. Is that, are we talking about the top strand here or the bottom strand? Okay, so those are the critical pieces of information we need to put together to be able to accurately describe uh, this position within the sequence. Chromosome or sequence names, um, the main constraint for these, obviously, if we're dealing with a set of sequences, is that, is that they need to be unique uh, because we need to be sure that we're definitely talking about the same sequence. And we fairly regularly with the software that we produce get bug reports in that the origin of those bug reports turns out to be that somebody has created a custom genome and they've ended up with multiple sequences with exactly the same identifier in. So that little bit of text immediately after the greater than symbol in the FASTA file, if you end up with two of those looking the same, um, then everything else is ambiguous from that point on. Um, another thing that ends up coming just back to by everyone that does anything with genomics is that the naming conventions for chromosomes have never quite been standardized. So if you uh, go to the NCBI, the big sequence repository in the States, and you go and download a chromosome sequence, um, if they have chromosome names on it, they will always be in the form of CHR and then the name, so chromosome X. If you go to the equivalent repository in the UK, so to like EBI or to Ensemble or one of those databases, they'll just have the name. So lots of programs or pipelines end up with weird incompatibilities um, because exactly the same sequence with exactly the same basis will be called two different things depending on where you ask. So not a lot to do about that, just be aware that the problem exists uh, and can cause trouble. The more interesting thing then is how we number the positions within our reference sequence to be able to describe the coordinates of a region that we've aligned to. So some things that have been agreed by everyone that does this and some things that haven't. So we need a start and an end position and what all of the file formats do say that we're not going to try and infer the strand from the start and the end. So the start is always the leftmost or the numerically lowest position. Okay, so even if we're on the bottom strand, our start will be lower than our end. We don't reverse the start and end positions to be able to describe that. Now, the place where they don't agree is how we numerically number the bases to be able to describe um, the start and end positions. And there are two different systems. The technical names for these, one is called a zero indexed half open system, and one is a fully indexed, fully open system. I'm gonna describe what both of those are. So the first one is zero indexed half open. And really what you're doing here is that you're describing the positions of bases, not by numbering the bases themselves, but by numbering the gaps between your bases, okay? So we have a numbering system that starts at zero, so, um, which is why this is a zero indexed system because the first number in this is zero and you're numbering the positions next to the bases. So I, um, I've heard this described as kind of fence posting. So that if you're trying to measure a fence, you can either measure the panels in the fence or you can measure the posts between them. Same thing in genomics. If you think of not fence, but a genomic sequence, in this case, the letters are the panels and the gaps between the letters are the posts. So here, zero is the position of the gap immediately before the first base, one is the gap between base one and base two. Two is the gap between base two and base three. Three is the gap between base three and base four, okay? And if you use this to describe this region, then you say, well, this sequence here is naught, one, two, three. So it starts at the third gap, numbering from zero, and it finishes at the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth gap, okay? So even though we have six bases in here, if we count the numbers in here, we have seven numbers, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, even though we only have six letters because we're numbering the gaps. So this is the zero indexed half open. And the advantage of this system is that if you want the length of the sequence, you just take your end value, you subtract your start. So nine minus three is six, and that's how many bases are in it, okay? But the first, anything that starts at the first base starts at position zero, okay? Which is a bit weird. The alternate is the 
one indexed fully open system and this is probably a bit easier to understand in that you just number the bases okay so here this g is base one a is base two t is base three and what you're then doing is saying well give me the number of the first base in the set and the last base in the set so here this would go from four to nine so in a one index fully open description of this my range will be start is four end is nine in my description of exactly the same sequence using the zero indexed half open it would go from three to nine. So it's really easy if you get the wrong interpretation of this to end up a base out when you look at your data. Okay. All the aligned data files then uh, contain all of the information that we've used uh, up to this point. So when we had FASTQ, we had um, an identifier, we had some base calls, and we had some quality scores and all of these alignment formats are going to contain all of that information plus some extra stuff okay and there are different formats but they're all variations around the same basic format so the information they contain and the way that they encode it is exactly the same so the three different formats that we've got is sam format sam format is a plain text format and it's normally what's spat out by your genomic aligners so if you run um, Bowtie 2 or you run HiSat or you run BWA, SAM format is generally what those are going to spit out, okay, because they don't care about how you're going to store it, they're just trying to generate this information as fast as possible. Um, it's plain text, so it's huge, um, so generally you want to compress this, so BAM is the most common format that you'll see, which is just the binary compressed version of SAM. Um, it's a compressed format. It's using something that's really quite similar to Kazip, but it allows random access. So you can leap into the middle of the file and start decompressing, well, not quite in, almost at, at every point, but at most points. Um, you can find somewhere very close to the data that you want that you can start decompressing. So BAM is simply the compressed version of SAM. I'll also mention CRAM. CRAM is well, it's compressed BAM, but it's compressed not just by doing a, a mathematical compression. It uses a reference-based compression to either make files even smaller or to actually make them smaller by uh, losing some information to really decrease the amount of storage that's taken up. Okay. BAM file structure, um, I'm going to focus on uh, BAM because it's the easiest thing to, to sort of describe, but it, the same rules are there for all the rest. Two sections, you have a header, sec header section, and the header section simply lists the sequences that are present in your reference, along with their lengths, and gives you the details of how this file was constructed. So which programs were run, what options were used, um, and you can have a look at that. So again, using the same SAM tools program we saw before, we can go and use it to look at the header for a BAM file. And you see that we get a little header line uh, and the header line says which version of the BAM format we're going to use so we're still on version one um, it says it's unsorted so I'll explain what that means in a second and then underneath you have a load of sequence lines which are just the different chromosomes and their lengths these are what are going to be used in the alignment so it can check that you don't have duplicated names and then at the bottom you get this whole set of PG header lines and these are the programs which have been used in the generation of this data so in this case this one was generated by HiSat2 uh, which was my aligner um, it tells me which version of the program and the command line that was used so I can see exactly how this uh, program uh, generated my BAM file now the alignments are kind of where all the detail is. Uh, this is a sort of single alignment on here. This would all be in one line in the actual file. Um, so I've obviously had to wrap it around several lines, uh, which makes it a bit messy and not very easy to see. Uh, they're just different sections that are tab separated. Um, so all I've done at the bottom is just to put them on top of each other instead of putting them one after the other. Uh, but these are the sections that you can see. So there are 12 sections inside here some of which we've seen already so the sequence name that's just the identifier from before we have these alignment flags which i'll talk about in a little more detail this is the reference sequence that it's been mapped to um, so this one aligned to chromosome 18 the start position so the leftmost position where the alignment starts 
The mapping quality, so this is another of these FRED scores that we saw before. So this is the likelihood that the reported position is incorrect. So 60 would be a really high FRED score, which would be a really low probability of it being incorrect. So it means that it's quite likely that this is the correct alignment. Um, we then have a cigar string, which describes the structure of the alignment. And again, I'll go into a little more detail about that. Um, we then have some fields that are kind of optional. So paired sequence name, if we had um, paired end data, so we had two reads coming from the same insert, it would tell us what the other end was called. Um, for any of these fields, if you don't know what the value is, you can put a star in and that's fine. Um, likewise, paired sequence position, we don't have one, is not there. And total insert length is the inferred distance between the two ends of the pair. And again, this is a single end one, so we don't have that. But if we did, it would be there. And then we get the information that we've already seen in the FASTQ file, so all the base calls and all the quality scores. Uh, quality scores in BAM should always be FRED 33. BAM was late enough that they'd sorted out their differences by then, and it's there. And then finally, in 12, you can have other tags, which is an extensible section where you can include tons of other information inside here. Let's look at a couple of the um, portions of this that I've skipped over. So let's start with the cigar string. So the cigar string is a way of describing the structure of the alignment. So it's the, um, the relative structure of the query sequence and the underlying reference sequence. So what's the relationship in terms of which bases pair up um, between those two sequences so that we can figure out exactly which base aligns to which. It's a small compact text representation of an alignment and it consists of sections which say well this is a match section or this is an insertion section or this is a deletion section because those are the main sort of three things that can happen in an alignment and each section has a length associated with it so the text is going to be built up by a set of numbers so that will be the length followed by a letter code to say what kind of relationship is happening between the query and the uh, reference at that point. This is the full set of codes that you can have. So N for a match, I for an insertion, D for a deletion, N for skipped region, um, various things for either soft or hard clipping, padding, uh, and then exact um, matches or sequence mismatches. So these are all the things that the format allows for. In practice, it's only really this sort of set of five that generally turn up uh, within uh, real examples, although you can put other ones in here, um, those are mostly the ones that you actually see used. Let's look at some examples of how this works so that you can see uh, what this, um, how it goes together and what they mean. So here I've got a short alignment of a sequence and a reference. Okay. And you can see that there are no insertions or deletions in here. There's a base mismatch, but really the cigar string generally doesn't concern itself with mismatches. It's after the relationship between the bases in the two and leaves you to figure out the matches or mismatches afterwards. Um, it's the structure of the alignment that it's trying to describe. So here, my match, my cigar string would be 12M because it starts from here and then 12 bases match between the sequence and the reference. There are no insertions and no deletions in here. So therefore all of these are matches. So M doesn't mean that the bases match. It means that equivalent positions are aligned against each other. So even though this mismatches, it's still the what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh base in the sequence is still aligned against the seventh base in the reference. Let's look at one where we do actually um, have something in here. So when we're talking about um, insertions or deletions, we're talking about insertions or deletions in the reference. So it's relative to the reference that we do those. So here we have three matched bases, and then we have to insert two bases into the reference to continue the alignment, and then the remainder, the remaining nine are matches. So our cigar string for this would be 3M, because there are three matches, 2i because there are two insertions and then 9m because then there are nine further matches to the end of the sequence here. One final example which is doing the same thing the other way around so now we have an insertion in the 
query sequence, but we don't care about that. We have to describe things uh, in terms of the reference. So although this is actually an insertion in the query sequence, we have to consider it as being a deletion in the reference. So here we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine matches in the reference, followed by a deletion of three bases, and then three more matches. So this will be 9M, 3D for three deletions, and then three further matches. Um, if the reason that the sequence broke the alignment and started it again wasn't uh, that it inferred an actual deletion, uh, but that it was a splicing event, if you were aligning RNA against DNA, then instead of using D to indicate a deletion, you would use N to indicate uh, a splicing event. So if this was jumping over an intron, sorry, an intron in the reference and the sequence was um, exonic, uh, then you'd use 9M3N3M. 3 3M. So you can tell the difference between the two. Okay, and that's how the alignment structure is described in here. One of the other fields that we had in here was uh, the BAM flags, and that field itself is just a number. Okay, it's a 12-bit binary number, and although it's stored as a single numeric value, what it actually indicates is 12 separate values which can either be true or false. So this is why they are flag values, because they can be on or off. There's no quantitation in them. And they are a series of parameters that between them describe uh, the uh, type of alignment that you have in here. So things like saying whether your sequence is a paired end sequence or it's single end, um, whether every section aligned or not, uh, whether this read aligned, um, uh, whether it's the first or second read of a pair if it is, uh, whether it aligns to the forward or reverse and whether it's pair aligned to the forward or reverse, um, if it's something that should be kicked out for failure for QC, if it can allow you to flag up duplicates um, and various other things in here. So when you look at this, you'll get something like the flag value being, for example, 1107, which if we expand that out in binary will be 12 values, um, so here, 11001010010, and those match up to these 12 values. Uh, there's a very nice little website down here on the Broad Institute, uh, which is just a web page that you can type this number in, and it will show you what those flags mean. So in here, I can type in 1107, and I can see that, okay, this is a read which is paired, um, that it's mapped in a proper pair. Um, it's, the read is not unmapped and the mate is also not unmapped. It maps to the reverse strand but the mate maps to the forward strand. This read is the first in the pair, it can't be the second in the pair, and it's also flagged as a duplicate. So if you, for example, run a duplicate flagging program, um, there's generally two ways they can operate. Some of them will actually kick the duplicated data out of your file. Others just modify this flag value to turn on the flag for the duplicate uh, and then leave it in the data and then let you sort that out afterwards, okay? Uh, but a lot of information is then contained in what is ultimately just a single number stored in the file. The final bit that we're going to look at in here then are the other tags. So this is an optional field uh, which is extensible and in some BAM files will be tiny or indeed absent and in others will have huge amounts of information. Um, so there are a huge number of tag value pairs that you can add. So you're going to get a text tag to say what piece of information is being provided and then an equals and then some actual data to say what it is. Uh, so it's a set of two letter tag codes followed by whatever you like really, any arbitrary data and it's up to the person that um, generated the BAMP file as to what they want to put in there. There are a whole bunch of standard tags, so I'll show you those in a second, but you can also add your own. So any tag, two letter tag code that starts with X, Y, or Z is user defined and it's up to you to do it. It's not a standardized thing, but you can use it for your own purposes. Uh, and these flags can be added by many different analysis tools. So it could be a duplicate thing that might put in there, the aligner might put tags in there, um, a variant caller that you run later on or any other program can add more flags in to increase the annotation on the file. These are some of the standard flags uh, that exist in here. So you can see the wide variety of stuff that's in here, um, some of which is 
or a lot of which probably are never used. Um, some of them are very commonly used. So uh, for example, we had um, the cigar string, which described the structure of our alignment, but it didn't actually figure out the um, base matches and mismatches. From the cigar string, the only way you would be able to work that out would be to go back to the reference sequence and compare your query sequence, which is in there with whatever the reference was. But for example, on here, there is this MD string, okay, which is um, a text string. So the type on here is uh, what type of data goes in it. So some of these are like the I strings are uh, numeric values. Um, the Z ones are text values. So the MD Z string uh, is uh, a set of pairwise comparisons of the bases that actually tell you what mismatches you had. Um, but all of these are standard and then anything with X, Y, or Z you can do. Uh, you can put whatever you want into there. I mentioned CRAM files. Uh, CRAM files are a way of making BAM files smaller um, and that they use a few different tricks. So some of these are what are called lossless compression so that you can regenerate the BAM file exactly and some of them are lossy compression so that you throw away some information in the BAM file and say well I'm happy to get rid of that information if it means that my uh, data is smaller. So the basic um, or the main sort of operation in CRAM files that makes them smaller is that they don't store your full set of sequence. Okay, so the BAM file has all of the base calls in it. In a CRAM file, because you're working on the basis that your sequence is going to be aligned to a reference genome and in most cases your sequence is going to either be identical to the reference genome or very nearly identical, so what that means is that you don't really need to store all of the base calls. What you can get away with doing is just storing the differences between your sequence and the reference. So if this was my read sequence here, and this is my reference, a conventional BAM file would put all of the bases in here, whereas a CRAM file will only store the bases where the read file is different the reference. So it, in order to reconstruct the read, you need to have access to the reference that you aligned against and you can just pull the bases out of there. Okay, So it makes it a bit more of a pain to work with because you have to keep the reference sequence around, but you're storing way less data uh, and your file can become substantially smaller on the back of that. Okay, So this is lossless compression. You can just regenerate the BAM file exactly from here, but there are other things that you can do to make it even smaller. Um, one of the most effective things is to remove the read names. You saw how long those Illumina read names were, and they actually contribute a very sizable portion of all of the information in your um, BAM file. So if you change those to just be an increasing integer, for example, it compresses way better and your file gets a lot smaller. So unless you actually need the read names, you can remove them and make your data smaller. Uh, the other one that they can do is that they can reduce the granularity of FRED scores. So we've said that FRED scores can go from a range from 1 to 60. Um, so you can make this smaller by saying, well, I'm not going to store every number. So instead of allowing it to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I'm going to allow it to be 1, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So I'm only allowing some numbers. That will make it smaller. In a sort of the most extreme scenario, you could even say, well, I'm just going to reduce it to two numbers a good call or a bad call. So I could make it 0 and 1 or 0 and 60, something like that. And that again will make it smaller. So all of these go to making this smaller and you trade off the convenience and the accuracy of your data against the size of file that you're going to produce. And for all of the reference stuff, the big trade off is that you need to keep the appropriate reference sequences around and compare those back to your data to get your reads out. With BAM files, there are two operations that often happen with them. So uh, we have um, both sorting and indexes. So our BAM files normally start off just in a random order. Okay, so whatever reader order is produced by the aligner, which is just chucking out alignments as fast as it possibly can, that's what goes into your BAM file. BAM files usually then are sorted to make them easier to work with. So they can either be sorted by the sequence name, which allows quicker retrieval if you have specific sequences you want to get to, Probably more commonly though, you will sort by alignment position. So sort by chromosome and then by leftmost position within that chromosome. Uh, and that allows you to retrieve reads from a particular region more quickly, which is often what you're doing. Fetch me the reads under this part of the genome. 
Um, the tools for doing this, there's two, there's a couple of ways of doing it. So SAM tool sort or Picard sort SAM, uh, both generate the same kind of index. So they've agreed on the indexing scheme and you can then index for random access. So this again will produce a BAI file like we had the FAI file for fast A. BAI is the equivalent for uh, BAM files, uh, which allow you then to read into that file in a much more efficient way. Okay. We've done most of the big formats, so now we're going to step through some others uh, fairly quickly. Uh, another set of information that can be useful is genome annotations. So obviously when we're quantitating data or we're doing something that requires relating our data to um, uh, particular features, we're going to need to describe those uh, annotation features. And we've got a few different formats that can be used for that. We'll start off with the simplest one, which is a bed file format. So bed files um, can have 12 fields in. So they are a text-based format with tab delimited fields in them. Um, they only need to have the first three fields in here. So the only thing you need to make a bed file is a chromosome name, a start position and an end position. And then all of these others are optional. You can put quantitative information in them, but mostly they're useful for um, putting uh, annotation information in, so like peak calls or genes or yeah, anything else that you've picked out. This is an example of the simplest kind of bed file. Uh, you only need to put three fields in, so a sequence name, start position and end position. This is in the zero indexed half open structure. Okay, so this is, this would go from base 41195 through to base 42363. Okay, so again, remember this is zero indexed and then through to the position after the last base. Um, and that's really straightforward. You don't need to put anything else in it, it just describes a set of regions. But you can make your bed files more complex. Let's look at a slightly more complex one. In this one, we're filling in up to position nine in here. So you have to add them obviously in order. So we still have the original position. And what we're trying to describe is this structure down here. So something where we have a feature that goes from the start position to the end position, but then it has a single more interesting region inside it. So what's called the thick start to the thick end. Um, we're also going to annotate this as being on the reverse strand instead of the forward strand. And we're going to give it a color. So bed files also give you some control over how the features are displayed. So in here, then, we have the chromosome start and end. We can put a name on the feature, okay, which could be the type of feature, or it could be the specific name that you want to put in. We can associate a numerical score, which is uh, a score that goes in the range from 0 to 1,000. Um, so we can put that in here. Um, we don't use it in this one, so I'm setting the rules of 0. We can put a strand on it, plus or minus. So this one's going to be on the reverse strand. And then we can put in the thick start and thick end to say, I want to highlight this region within it. So these have to be within the coordinates of the overall feature. And then finally, we can say what color we want it to be. And these are three values that go between 0 and 255, uh, separated by commas that say, uh, the amount of red, green, and blue that goes in. So this has no red, no green, and is all blue. So this is a blue feature that's coming in here. Okay, so we can make that uh, a little bit more complex by adding fields to our bed file. The most complex you can get with a bed file is that you can describe multi exon features uh, within a bed file. Um, there are some limitations, so they all have to be on the same strand, and you have to have a simple linear structure for them. And for those, we're adding all of the fields that we had before, but we're putting three final fields on here. This thing that says block count, block sizes, and block starts. So this, instead of having that thick feature before, which just adds a single feature, we can add any number of sub features to our bed file. So here, block count in this file says, we have three substructures within our bed file. Block sizes says my first feature is going to be 100 bases long, second is 50, third is 300 bases long, and then block sizes, again, zero indexed. So the first one starts at the beginning of the sequence. Second one starts at the 450th base, which is the 449th gap. 
and the third one starts at the 700th base which is the 699th gap so here we go we've got a hundred base pair exon that starts at the beginning we have a 50 base pair exon that goes 450 bases in and we have a 300 base pair exon that goes 700 bases in okay so that's as complex as you can get with bed files but you can describe these more complex structures in addition to putting the actual annotation lines into bed files there's uh, another concept which turns up for um, a lot of the other annotation formats which is that you can give hints to the program which is displaying your annotations as to how you want them to be annotated and these are the so-called track lines so these are kind of like header lines that go at the top of your file that say how the data underneath them should then be represented they all start with the word track and then there's a whole bunch of um, names that you can put after and you have key equals value pairs uh, of annotation to say different bits of information about that annotation set so here I'm annotating on the name of the track that I want to put in so that will be generally what's shown on the left of the genome browser when you do it uh, the description might be something that comes up if you put your mouse over it and it hovers and it tells you what it actually is um, in this one Visibility is a parameter that's mostly used by the UCSC genome browser, which just says how the data is defined. So they have a few different schemes that give you different levels of detail for the things that you're looking at. So if I say visibility is two, that gives me the full view where I'm going to see each individual feature in quite a lot of detail. And then finally, color is I can assign a single color to all of the uh, features in this track. So in this one, this would be a quite a bright red so again it's the amount of red green and blue there's a couple of options with color so you can set a single color for the track and that just overwrites everything else you can say instead of saying color you can say color by strand and now you give it six numbers the first three are for the color for top strand features and the second three are the color for bottom strand features so you can color forward and reverse things separately and also you could say item rgb equals on um, and that would mean that instead of setting the color for the whole track that you use those color features in the actual bed file to define the colors of the feature so you can color each individual feature separately okay so this annotation at the top can give hints to the program that you're using so that might be something like igv or ucsc browser or ensemble to say how you want it to represent that track uh, within the browser. Um, much like we had indexed forms of some of the other files that we've looked at before, so FASTA and um, BAM files, you can do something similar with BED files. So big BED format is an indexed version of a bed file so there's a program bed to big bed which is part of the UCSC tools software package um, big bed files are uh, indexed they're sorted and they're indexed so you can do this sort of random access uh, they're a binary format file and the reason for doing this um, if you're going to put this into a web browser is that it allows you to operate on your data in a different way so with a bed file generally if you're going to put that into um, a remote browser you have to upload the whole of that file to the website so it can then figure out where everything is so it knows what to display in the track with a big bed file what you can do is to index this and then put it onto your web server and then the URL for that file on your web server goes to the remote site which means it doesn't have to read all of it you don't have to upload all of the data it can then selectively query that file on your web server to pull out just the bits it needs for an individual view so if you've got lots of data you can put lots of data into a remote viewer see all of those tracks without having to send everything and laboriously upload that all to the remote site you can keep the data on your site update it when you want and your remote view will um, update immediately. Okay, so it's quite nice um, and flexible in being able to do that. Um, the probably most common standard for comprehensive uh, annotation files is um, a pair of closely related formats. Um, we're going to talk about GFF, the general feature format file, but we'll also talk about GTF, which is just an extension of that. 
Um, and this is a comprehensive annotation format. You can describe any structure of annotation or feature using this format. So if, it's not like bed files that, for example, have to say, well, if you've got sub features, they've all got to go on the same strand. You can have GFF features that aren't even on the same chromosome. You could describe sort of translocations and all sorts of strange structures with this. It's very flexible. It's another text-based format, tab delimited with many of the same kinds of attributes that we saw before. So chromosome, um, source is kind of the program or the database that produced it. Um, feature type, start, end, quantitative score, similar to what we saw in the bed file, strand plus or minus, um, frame, which is optional, but if you're doing a translation frame, so if you have like an, uh, a coding exon, then you can say the frame that that exon starts coding in, so you can figure out the translation from it. Uh, and then you have a, a bunch of these sort of more flexible features where you can have um, groups or attributes in here. This is uh, what one of these looks like. So this is um, something that describes a complete gene. So it's describing both a gene and a transcript that comes from that gene and the exons that make up that transcript. So the first parts are just the chromosome, the source, the type of feature and the position. Okay, so start, end, we're not doing scores on here, and then the strand. Um, then you have the way that the structure is built up, and that's all accommodated in these sort of group and attributes at the end. These files um, have relationships between different entries, and they are parent-child relationships. So here for the gene, I simply have an identifier, okay, so it says this is an the idea of this is that it's a gene and it's this ensemble gene identifier. Okay, I can put other things like its name and its description and whatever else. For the transcript, I then have a transcript identifier, okay, because that's what this is. Uh, and I then have a parent identifier. So this is the parent of this feature is the gene with this identifier. So we can figure out that this transcript comes from this gene. The transcript then says, well, which part of this gene is transcribed? And there may be several transcripts for the same gene. This one only has one. Underneath that, then we have exon features. Again, chromosome start, end, strand, all of which could be different. Um, and they as well have a parent. So their parent is the transcript. So from this exon, I can work out that these three exons then relate to this transcript. And this transcript comes from this gene. So we have a multi-layered structure that builds up the description of our um, feature. Okay, so you can see that because each of these sub-features has all of these attributes itself, you can annotate up the features, you can put information at any level, and you can build up structures of arbitrary complexity. So it's completely flexible. Um, this is GFF. GTF was a variant on GFF, which was just a slightly stricter version of GFF that said what attributes you had to include. So it had a standardized naming scheme for how you described the relationships. So now you have to specify a gene ID. Um, you have to have transcript IDs for transcripts, exon IDs for exons, and you reuse those. So instead of saying parent, uh, where you could make links between any type of feature and any other type, this encodes within the format, the fact that you're going to have relationships from gene down to transcript, down to exon. Okay, so GTF is the same idea as GFF, but with some slightly stricter things and slightly stricter formatting definitions for how these go together. Like you have to have a space after semicolons in a GTF, whereas in a GFF you don't. Okay, so but other than that, the two are really very similar. Okay, on to the last big section then in here, which is uh, formats for describing quantitative data. Okay, so we've seen raw sequence data, mapped data, annotation data. Now we're going to look at if you want to display a quantitation that you've produced. We have three different formats, all of which are going to be useful for that. So all of these um, have limits on the, uh, the formats that we've seen before have limits um, on the type of quantitation you can put in. A lot of these formats have scores associated with them. So BED, Big BED, GFF and GTF all have a score field, but they can only score integers between naught and a thousand. So um, some formats are more flexible and give you more flexibility and really are the ones that would generally be used for quantitative uh, 
NGS data. Probably the most common one that you get to see are WIG files. Uh, so these are files which are designed for continuous quantitation. So I've tiled something across my entire genome and I have a running measure. So you get those nice little sort of plots there. You can see the expression and things or the measures going up and down. You very commonly see these for sort of ChIP-seq or ATT-seq type data sets. And the, um, the main aspect of these files is it tries to represent these quantitations in as compact a way as possible. So things that you have to do, you've got to define the chromosome, chromosome name, and optionally, you can say um, how wide your individual measures are. So in a WIG file, it's assuming that the windows that you're measuring in are all the same size. And then you can list all of your quantitative values underneath. So you only need to specify your chromosome once, and then you can just put all of your values underneath, assuming that you're dealing with the same chromosome. There are two levels of compaction for the quantitated data. You can either have two fields where you have a start position and then a value, or you can just have something where you say, well, I've measured every possible window across this, where you can just list the values. So if I show some examples, it's, you'll quickly see how this works. So here we have one of these header lines, which says what kind of wiggle file this is. So this is one with variable steps. So although all of the measurements that we've got in here have a span of 10, so they're all 10 base pair windows we're measuring in, not every possible 10 base pair window is included in here. In this instance, then, we are going through chromosome X, and we have a window that starts at 103301 which has this value. Then we go on another 10 bases, we get this value. Then we go on another 10 bases, we have this value. Then we have a jump. So we go from 21 up to 62 is our next one. It's still a 10 base pair window, but we jumped over some bases and then we can go on. So that way with a variable step, we include the start position and the quantitative value. The simpler version is that we do fixed step windows where we say, again, this is chromosome X, we're going to start at this position. So our first position that we're going to report is going to be 103301. Our step size is going to be 10. So the difference between consecutive measurements, they're going to start 10 bases apart from each other. And the span, the width of measurement is going to be 10 bases. Okay, so these are going to be tiled one after the other. And now we don't need to put the positions in. We can just list all of the quantitative values straight underneath each other. OK, so this is the most compact form where all we're recording in here, other than a header, which is pretty minimal, are just the quantitative values. So this will keep the value as small as possible. OK, so those are what we get in here. Uh, the base positions in here are one indexed. So this really is base 301 um, and they are fully open. So we would start to use the base. For the end, we would use the base that we're on. So for the first base, 10 bases of chromosome one, we'd use one and then 10 for the span. Um, big wig is the equivalent to big bed. So it's the way that you can index a wig file and again, do random access into it. So you can put it up on your web server so that it can pull the quantitative data in an efficient way without having to upload everything. Okay, so same idea as we saw for big bed. Big wig is the compacted indexed version of wig files. If you have features which are a varying sized, at varying sizes and spaced at varying differences, then WIG files aren't very good for doing that. They're really designed for you having fixed size measurement windows. When your measurement windows are irregular, so for example, I've made a measurement for every gene, so not only are the start positions different, the lengths are different, then bed graph is a variation which allows you to do that. So bed graph is a chromosome, a start, which is zero indexed in this case, an end, which is the zero indexed half open, so exactly the same as we had for bed files, and then a value. Okay, so four things in here. So we have to explicitly say chromosome start end value, which is more verbose, but if you have irregularly spaced uh, features, then it's much more flexible. Um, bed graphs also use track definitions, as indeed do WIG files. Um, there are an awfully lot, awfully larger number of options that you can put in for bed graph. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff. These are kind of the UCSC 
uh, versions of this. So by tinkering with that, you can really customize the way that this data is displayed in your uh, genome browser. Okay, on to the last thing that we're going to look at then, uh, which is uh, a file format for storing variant calls. So obviously not every NGS experiment is all about variants, but if you're doing genomics experiments, uh, then often the end point of this is a set of genomic variants, uh, which you can then explore in various ways and try and uh, attribute to biology. And there is a single format that pretty much gets used for all of uh, these, which are VCF files. And although it's a single format, there's an awful lot of flexibility in it and lots of programs use it in quite different ways. So VCF files are the output from variant callers um, and they represent genomic variants and the relevant pieces of uh, data that we use to generate them. So not only is the variant stored, but lots of other sort of metadata around the quality of it, the amount of data that was there and the details of how that call was arrived at. Um, VCF files um, have developed over time. So whereas we saw that for BAM file, it said which version of the BAM file was this, and it was version one, um, there are a lot more revisions of VCF files. So I'm going to describe the latest one, which is version 4.3. And a lot of these are around uh, the extensible fields and how they should be used. As we saw with the BAM files, uh, there are two sections in here, um, the header and the body. The header is a lot of metadata about the experiment, the processing, and some descriptions of the annotation that go into the file. And the body are the actual variant details. So much like we saw in the BAM file, we have the description of the overall sort of stru uh, study, and then we have the data. Same thing for VCF files. Now with VCF files, we have some standard fields, but lots of the important and interesting detail in here um, fall into some of these more flexible columns. So in this one, I'm going to talk about the info column and the format and sample columns, which are more of these sort of key value pair type columns uh, that actually provide a lot of the useful information for the sample. Let's have a look at the standard fields that you provide in a VCF file. So a lot of these, there's no sort of great mystery about a lot of things we've seen before. So the chromosome or the reference sequence name in there, uh, position is one based Okay, so this is the position of the um, sequence that we're, uh, of the variation position uh, within the reference sequence. Um, there are kind of links to various databases encoded within the format. Uh, so the ID here is not the ID of your read, it's if the variant itself has been identified in the dbSNP database. Um, for example, it doesn't have to be dbSNP, but normally that's what's used. Uh, then you put the actual identifier in there, or you just put a dot if there isn't one. The variant itself is described with two fields, this ref and alt, and both of these contain sequences. So the ref is a portion of sequence at the position that you listed here uh, to say what was present in the reference sequence. And then the alt is what was actually seen in the sample that you were measuring. Okay, so you end up with two alternates. The ref is what was originally put in your reference genome and the alt is what you saw. If those two sequences are the same length, so for example, if the ref says G and the alt says C, then you would assume that this is a sort of single nucleotide polymorphism. It's just a base substitution um, because you started with one base, you finished with one base and it's just that base that changed. If you have an insertion or a deletion, then what you will find is that one of those um, sequences will contain a different number of bases to the other. So for example, if our ref had six bases in it, it had three Gs and three Cs, and the alt just had G in it, then you would assume that there was a five base pair deletion, okay? Because bases had disappeared from the reference to make the alternate. Alternatively, if it would go the other way, so if your reference just had A in it and your alt had ATG in it, then that would be a two base insertion, okay? Because the alternate had two more bases in than the reference did. So that's how you can describe the basic um, difference between the two. We have a quality score. So this is the quality of the inferred uh, variants. Uh, and again, this is another FRED score. So the same as we saw in the FASTQ files and we saw in the BAM files, here's another use of FRED scores uh, for variants. Um, we have a filter, which is a flag saying uh, 
which filters we've applied on this, you can have multiple ones uh, and to say whether it passed or failed those various filters. And then a lot of the interesting stuff comes in these info, format and sample fields. Okay, So info is um, much like we saw for the tag fields in the BAM file, they are key value pairs that add extra information about this variant. Okay, so for this particular variant, there's all sorts of information that you might want to describe about the quality of it or whatever. Um, we'll see the fields that you can put in and those would all go in there. Format and samples then allow you to put either um, text or numeric information pertaining to the set of samples from which this variant was generated. So variants normally are not just called on a single observation. You may have observations over many different samples um, and you might have measured several metrics in each of those samples. So what you can do in here is in the format field, you give a list of identifiers to say what types of values you've recorded for your samples. Okay, so it doesn't actually put any values in, it just says these are the things that I'm going to describe. And then this plus down here says that you can then add on an arbitrary number of sample columns for all of the samples that you actually included when you were doing the call. And for each of those samples, you can then say what values you actually recorded for the extension fields that you put into the format field. Okay, I'll show you an example and it will become a bit clearer when we get to that. Um, as before, there are a bunch of standardized values that can go into the info and format fields, and then there's a bunch of things that people make up. Um, so although I'm going to show you some things here, there will be other um, extensions that different programs uh, use or different groups use for their own meanings. So here we have the key value pairs that go into the info column. So these are things that relate to the actual variant call itself. Okay, so you can see that we've got all of these. So I think some of these we've seen before, so cigar strings for alignments, um, some things relating to uh, variants, some relating to the mapping quality of the uh, alignments used to call this, um, strand biases and uh, all sorts of other things that might pertain to that. Okay, but those are all things that relate to the variant itself. In the um, format column then we have these codes that say the different types of things that I can put into my individual sample columns. So these would just be um, something where I would say these codes I have recorded for my samples. And then in the subsequent sample columns, you would say, well, these are the values that I recorded for them. Okay, so these again, don't relate, relate to the variant. They relate to the samples from which the variant was called. Let's finish off then by having a look at a couple of examples. Here's a simple VCF example. So this is, on chromosome 11 at this position, it has an RSID, so therefore it's uh, something that's known in dbSNP. I have a single letter reference and a single letter alt, so this is a base substitution, it's a SNP, it's not an insertion or a deletion. I have a quality, which is a Fred score quality, which is ridiculously good, 100 is a stupidly good uh, quality. It passed whatever filters that I've put in. And then in the info, we've recorded various bits of information. So you could go back and look up and see what the, uh, so AA is the ancestral allele, um, AC, AF, AF, uh, AFR. All of these are different tags that we can look up. We can separate on the semicolons and we can read the tag value uh, pairs out of there, all of which relate to this variant. Here we uh, have only a single sample in here, so we called this from one sample, so there's only one sample column, and in our format column uh, we've put only a single attribute the recording, so this GT, which is the genotype column, um, and it says that for this sample it recorded this um, as heterozygous, okay, so this means the zero one means one was the alternate and one was the reference, um, so that we got out, but we only recorded one value for it. The final example I'll show is a more complex one where I'm looking not only at the data, but also at the information in the header to show you what sort of information you get from here. So we will, the header is all described by uh, lines with two uh, hash, hash marks on the start. We've got the format and the date. 
uh, we've got the assembly that was used for it, and then we have some information about the fields that are recorded in our info or format columns. So here I'm going to record two different types of information. I'm going to use svlen and svtype. So here in info you can see svtype and svlen, and I can put a longer description to say what these things actually mean. And for some of them, I'm going to put actual sort of defined meanings to the values. So here, when I say um, SV type, I'm going to put in some uh, alternates. So what are things are allowed to be SV types? So here, my SV types are going to be del, dup, ints, inf, or CMV. And that's for putting in deletions, duplications, insertion of a novel sequence, inversions, or copy number variable regions, so that I can see that del down here is an allowed type for SV type. Okay, so for SV len, I've just said it's a length, so there's no further description of that. In the format, this time I've recorded two values. So before we just saw one, but now we can see that we're recording two values for each sample. So GT and GQ, where GT is the genotype and GQ is the genotype quality. And I've recorded this for two um, samples. So here, NAO01 has a genotype of 1, 1, so that's homozygous, and a quality of 14. NA also is homozygous, but with a quality of 12. Okay, uh, this particular thing, we can see this is a deletion, and we could also have figured out that it was a deletion by looking at the reference and alternate. So because our reference is long and our alternate is short, bases have been removed. Okay. That's it. So what we've done during the session then is to go through all of these different file formats, which turn up all the way through the processing steps that we would do in uh, our sort of NGS experiments. Hopefully this has given you a good overview of what these are so that when you get given these files or you need to produce files for a certain purpose, uh, you've got a reasonable idea now about what the choices are, what data is in there. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, if anyone's got any questions, I'll open up the stream now and we can uh, sort of answer those. This uh, video will be up on YouTube later this afternoon, um, so you can put things in the comments there. But if you've got questions now, just unmute yourself and ask or put them in the chat and we will go through them now.